Good morning, everyone, and welcome to welcome to the first of a series of webinars hosted by myself, uh, Darren Sindon, and of course my colleague Clive Lambert. And thank you, Michal, for that uh, very interesting introduction. Okay, uh, as you as you know, the title of the webinars are the long and the short of it. Um, what we intend to do here is look at both uh, topical subjects, what's driving the markets currently, and also take a look at the history of trading, the history of the markets, and where we how we got to the current complex financial system that we all operate and live in. And with that in mind, I'd just like to say good morning to Clive, and move on to our first slide. And in this slide, uh, the mood of the markets, we'll try and look at this every Tuesday and Thursday, and we'll look at the, the issues that are driving the markets and the, the sentiment, if you like, that's, that's colouring thinking, what that's meant and what that's likely to mean. And we'll also come back to these topics at the end of each seminar. We'll try and round off each session with a flavour of what we can expect uh, in the, the days ahead. So over the last couple of weeks in the markets, uh, we've really seen them being dominated uh, by two key events and in effect the fallout from them. Uh, the first really was the uh, recent ECB meeting and interest rate decision and the second key event as far as we're concerned really, uh, the September uh, non-farm payrolls or unemployment numbers in the US. Now the, uh, the, the meeting at the ECB, no real surprises, uh, but uh, they did once again disappoint the markets by not introducing a program of quantitative easing proper and perhaps in what we might see as a rather a typical EU halfway house or, or even fight if you're a cynic, uh, they opted instead just to buy limited tranches of asset backed securities. We won't get into too much detail here but suffice to say that wasn't seen by the markets as being supportive enough of the EU economy and of course you, you've got to bear in mind that that follows hard on the heels of a rather disappointing take-up by EU banks at the ECB's latest funding round, the so-called TLTRO, a bit of a mouthful, but that stands for Targeted Long-Term Refinance Operation. And that's a, a, a financing operation uh, by, designed by the ECB to directly stimulate uh, Europe's flagging economy, uh, but the banks didn't take up anywhere near as much money as people were expecting, and, and therefore that, that left a bit of a sour taste in the uh, in the mouth of investors. On a more positive note, though, um, U.S. unemployment numbers actually exceeded expectations and were seen, at least initially, as being very positive for the U.S. economy. But I think we got a real flavour of just how fragile uh, investor sentiment was soon after, and it wasn't long before doubts crept back into the markets, and those doubts are principally focused around global growth, the strength of, uh, of the US economy as and when uh, the Fed stops its asset purchases, which will be this month, and eventually moves, to, moves away from its low interest rate and loose monetary policy. Um, so those doubts have knocked equity markets once again, and as we've seen over the last few days, and weeks, risk is definitely off the table for now. Uh, Equity is weaker, but not so the dollar. Dollar remains resilient, and of course, safe haven assets such as uh, the US bonds have rallied uh, once again as investors uh, seek uh, a safe home for their money. So, here's a slide about what the money thinks, and what I mean by this is what what can we discern from uh, what money managers and investment advisors are thinking uh, and planning uh, for the future. So this is a slide uh, courtesy of uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch and it's taken from their very, influen very influential uh, fund manager survey, in this instance from, from the most recently published one which was in September. And in this slide they ask uh, fund managers who look after some $556 billion uh, of assets what they thought would happen to the dollar and the euro uh, on a rolling 12-month basis. They've been asking this question since 2001. Uh, and as you can see, um, opinion there is, is very fixed. Um, the dollar, which is the line in blue, expected to continue to rally. And the euro, uh, the line drawn in red, is expected to continue to weaken. And there's clear divergence and has been really uh, between those two currencies since the turn, or the prospects for those two currencies since the turn 
of 2013. That's the kind of insight I think it's important for investors to be aware of. It, yes, it probably is a crowded trade to be uh, long the dollar, short the euro, but given that, uh, that you know people that back that amount of money are thinking it's going to continue to 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 be the trade to to play, the divergence is going to continue. We can't really afford to ignore that. So moving on uh, to a slide that we call sound bites, uh, and this is really just just a, an attempt to get a bit of a flavour of what the media is thinking about uh, the current state of uh, of the markets. Uh, the first uh, soundbite is from uh, the FT. Uh, the outlook for the global economy is darkened as the International Monetary Fund warned, as it, est as it estimated, there is now a 40% chance that the Eurozone will slide into a third recession since the financial crisis. Now that uh, little snippet was drawn from the FT of last week, but I think uh, you know if you've been looking at the headlines this morning, you will have seen uh, we've had some further disappointing news out of the Eurozone. Uh, and nothing really uh, has, has changed that in the in the last week to to make us think any differently fr from from that particular comment. Um, Wall Street Journal macro horizons: August dire manufacturing orders data came came very weak, and German industrial production numbers were, were likewise. Uh, the data reinforces the latest purchase managers survey, which pointed to an overall contraction in German manufacturing during September. And again, you know, it's concerning that. Uh, what has been the powerhouse of uh, the European economy, uh, you know, the, the German exporting machine, is uh, is struggling. Um, not all bad news because we had some uh, positive numbers from Daimler this morning, so it's not it's not uh, a, you know completely dark out there. But there's probably at the minute, at least in the minds of investors, more bad news than there is good. Uh, and finally, um, one other thing, Darren, just to Sorry, Darren, just to interrupt you for a second, it's Clive here, mate. Um, we also had the um, German ZEW uh, sentiment. Uh, numbers this morning, and they look pretty awful, and that caused a, another uh, weakening in the euro against the US dollar, and it sort of fits in with the the, the whole picture you're painting. So uh, that's an interesting uh, thing to throw into the mix as well, mate. Okay, thank you very much, Clive. So as Clive points out, further data this morning that uh, that is uh, sort of reinforcing that picture of euro weakness and dollar strength. Uh, so from from the global market overview. Uh, comments here that global growth and doubts about the effectiveness of central bank policy have undermined risk appetite, driving global equity and industrial commodity prices lower, but enhancing the appeal of US government bonds. And I think that's going to be a pattern that we'll come back to uh, over uh, the coming days and weeks. So having sort of set a framework for, uh, for where we are now, let's have a look at uh, perhaps how we got to be here and, uh, and how we came to to be in a market that uh, uh, and a financial climate that allows people to trade globally from from all say from all around the world from the often from the comfort of their own front room, but uh, how do we get to here? So FX is the market that we're going to be concerned about today, and we'll, and it is the world's without show that the world's largest financial market. But how did we we come to a to a five trillion turnover market uh, from humble beginnings? So perhaps the first thing to do is to look at what FX actually is, uh, and at its simplest level, FX or foreign exchange can be thought of as the mechanism that creates a valuation between the currencies of two or more sovereign states. Uh, today the global FX market drives the modern world economy and touches the lives of much of the world's population on a daily basis, whether they know it or not. Now that's quite a profound statement, but as we'll see, uh, in the coming slides, it's uh, it's actually quite quite a true one as well. The modern FX market at a glance. Well, these <laughs> this slide and these stats are drawn from the Bank for International Settlements data from their uh, uh, quarterly summary. This in this instance from December 2013, trading in the FX market reached an all-time high of 5.3 trillion dollars per day in April 2013 a 35% increase relative to turnover in 2010. Now 5.3 trillion is an astounding number in anyone's uh, language, uh, but to think of that as a daily turnover is quite quite extraordinary. Uh, if we have a look at the, uh, at the chart here on the left, you can see the breakdown of the, by instrument, and the two principal uh, methods of trading FX, FX swaps, and the market that we're probably, which is the, the bottom 
portion in blue, and the market that we're predominantly interested in here, the yellow swathe, which is spot FX, the product that, uh, that we'll be concerning ourselves with. So taking all that in, thinking about 5.3 trillion a day, how do we get to that extraordinary figure from, as I say, from, from relatively humble beginnings? Well, let's, uh, let's start by posing a question, and that question is, did you buy a cup of coffee today? Now, it might seem a strange question to ask, but if you did buy a cup of coffee today, then the likelihood is then that you were involved in a transactional chain that ultimately relied on foreign exchange. You probably paid for your coffee in your local currency, and perhaps you bought your drink in a US-owned chain store. Uh, the coffee that you're drinking was probably grown by a farmer in Brazil, Kenya, Colombia, or even Costa Rica, and those coffee beans were sold by that by that farmer, sold by that farmer to a wholesaler in, say, Brazilian reals. The wholesaler, in turn, sold sold that crap on that crap on to the coffee chain in US dollars, and some of those dollars the wholesaler then converted back into reals to pay the farmer. The US chain then shipped that coffee to London, where it was sold to a customer, in this instance we'll say in Great British Pounds, and the profits on that cup of coffee were ultimately converted back into US dollars by the US company. So you can see, you know, a trade that started perhaps in South America, uh, went into uh, US dollars, moved over into sterling, in, into London, and back into US dollars, and, and some of the money back into reals to facilitate the whole transactional chain for just a simple cup of coffee. Now, of course, we can extrapolate that out um, quite significantly, and we'll have a look at just what international trade means to foreign exchange in a moment. Now, FX has been empowering trade, travel, and commerce in one way and another since ancient times, and this map just gives you a flavour of the international trade routes that existed in the 17th century. Uh, obviously, much more developed and sophisticated today, but traders have been moving goods and services around uh, the globe for as long as they've been able to, to reach from point A to point B. The modern world of commerce, of course, is considerably more sophisticated. And this slide here, which is taken from uh, the World Trade Organization, the trade stats of 2013, gives you a flavor of the size of the global economy. And I think the key thing here is the fact that uh, merchandise trade, physical trade of World Trade Organization members totaled $17.3 trillion in 2012. So again, we're talking about uh, substantial sums of money and goods and services moving around the world, and as I say, all of, that, all of that is facilitated by foreign exchange in one shape or another. So how do we get to this modern world of trillion dollar commerce? Well, things started, as I said, with, uh, with ancient and medieval trade routes and medieval trade fairs where buyers and sellers of goods and services would come together at regular organized events. But, they all need, but these merchants from foreign countries would all need a method or a manner in which they could trade with each other. So they needed something that everyone believed had a recognized value, and gold and silver, precious metals, were the obvious medium exchange amongst merchants for different countries. Gold and silver coins could be weighed, and as long as you believe that the uh, the purity was was at least a similar or standardized version, then you could make a transaction. And the coins were often halved or quartered. Uh, there's a picture here of a silver half half penny, or a penny that's literally been just been cut in half uh, by somebody at a trade fair, and that's that's ex exactly where we get the phrase half penny from, and how that that phrase came to enter the English lexicon. So. Medieval half penny, cut, silver penny cut in half there to, to, to create some change. Okay, but we move on quite quickly uh, in, as, as we start to enter the Renaissance and we see the emergence of modern banking. And modern banking can trace it root, its roots back to Renaissance Italy as uh, merchants within the prosperous city states such as Venice, Florence, and Genoa began to offer deposits and loans and trade finance and other services to their customers. And in fact, the oldest existing bank in the world is Banco Monte di Pascia di Siena, which uh, is, as the name suggests, Italian and is still active and has been since 1472. So uh, you 
best part of 600 years old there. Perhaps the best known of the Renaissance banking dynasties uh, were the Medici, and they, they rose from humble beginnings to become Grand Dukes of Tuscany and introduced many conventions that we still use today, perhaps the most famous of which is double entry bookkeeping. But none of these advances in banking would really have been possible if we'd all had to lug bags and bags of gold and silver coins around, and it was the, in, or the introduction of paper money into Europe which, which, which sped up and, and modernised, if you will, the trade routes and modern banking. And paper money was first introduced in China during the reign of the Tang Dynasty, as long ago as AD 618, and they introduced the first sort of method of, of paper payment, if you will, in the form of bills of credit and notes of exchange that merchants could exchange with each other, uh, knowing that they would be rewarded in the proper value. Uh, a certain amount of trust was required, but uh, but but as these as these notes of credit and exchange became more commonplace, they were ultimately involved into paper money that we know today. That uh, use of paper money would, would eventually spread from China to Europe, and paper money was widely adopted across Europe in the late 17th century. Uh, the irony perhaps being here that uh, the Chinese had abandoned paper money almost three centuries before, after printing too much paper caused an inflationary crisis across uh, medieval China. So what was the basis for exchange between merchants uh, from different countries if they were trying to trade in paper money? Well, there was a simple me method really that uh, relates back to, to the exchange of gold and silver coins at medieval trade fairs, and it was simply this, that if you knew the cost of an ingot of gold in country A, and you knew the cost of the same ingot in country B, you have a mechanism to determine the rate of exchange between those two currencies. Quite simply then, if the cost of the gold ingots is two pounds in country A and five florins in country B, then all other things being equal, there are two and a half florins to the pound. That's quite simply five divided by two. So we'll just run through that again. The cost of an ingot of gold in country A is two pounds. The cost of the same ingot in country B is five florins. All other things being equal, then there are two and a half florins to the pound. Five divided by two. Now from that simplistic method of, uh, of, of determining the value of two currencies, we start to see the, the birth of the, of the modern banking industry uh, and modern trade and capital flows. And by the start of the 19th century, the influence of the Italian banking dynasties had to some extent faded, and the next wave uh, were of banking dynasties were establishing themselves across Europe, and none more so than a name I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, the Rothschilds. And it was their innovative approach to banking, with branches in five major European centres that gave them a competitive advantage over their peers, and provided them with the blueprint, really, for, for how a modern merchant bank would run. And as with so many uh, advances in, uh, in technology and, uh, and finance, uh, war had its part to play, and during the Napoleonic Wars, the Rothschilds were able to arrange shipments of bullion to Wellington's troops in Europe, facilitate payments by the British Crown in foreign currencies to the continental allies who were, he who were helping the, the Brits uh, fight Napoleon, and, and at the same time they raised an estimated $6.8 billion in modern terms across Europe to allow Britain to finance the war. And that was quite revolutionary to, to go out, raise money in foreign currencies, being able to move that money back from Europe across to the UK, and at the same time to be able to take money from the UK and pay foreign allies, troops fighting abroad, um, and it, it really sort of uh, showed how a, a well-oiled financial machine and a, and a proper system of foreign exchange could aid uh, in a war. But also in, in latter years, in, in the times of peace, that network, that same network of branches and contacts across Europe would allow the Rothschilds to finance and facilitate trading commerce as the Industrial Revolution spread out of the UK and across the Western European continent. Trade and commerce amongst the European powers then is pretty well established, and the principle of convertibility of a currency against a fixed amount of gold would form the basis of a system that would run at first informally, 
and then through statute and legislation from the late 18th century through to the 1930s. And that, that system or practice became known as the gold standard. Those nations that adopted the gold standard pledged to tie the amount of paper money that they would, they would put into circulation to the amount of gold they held in reserve. And usually you would have two, two times the amount of paper money that you had in, had in gold. So if you had, just for notional sake, £100 worth of gold, you could print £200 worth of paper money. A system of fixed exchange rates then benchmarked to gold facilitated a period of tremendous global economic growth. The gold standard would prove to be highly successful and would not be totally abandoned until the 1970s. However, its limitations would be exposed by World War One and the subsequent inflationary bubbles caused by the excessive printing of money, and that you know is a is a thing we'll come back to probably time and time again, how uh, how inflation and uh, and the temptation to print money can undermine a currency and the the value of a currency impact and ultimately um, the stability of an economy. But let's just have a look at, uh, at one fact here, just to give you an idea of how stable the gold standard was for a great deal of time. In 1834. The United States fixed the price of gold at $20.67 per ounce. Remember, of course, that price of gold then reflected the convertibility of the dollar into other currencies. And that gold price would remain in place until 1933. It's hard for us to imagine the price of gold being fixed for 100 years, but that such was the case in the, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But all that was to change, um, but two key events really um, forced the hand of the world's major financial powers. And the gold standard started to break down initially in the wake of the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the Great Depression that followed it. And the UK was forced to leave the system uh, in 1931 as capital kept flowing out of the, the country and the US would be forced to nationalise all privately held gold uh, in 1933 in an attempt to protect the value of the dollar. A World War II effectively finished the gold standard off completely and it was pretty obvious to the great powers that a new system would need to be found to replace it uh, when peace eventually would come in 1945. So in the summer of 1944, uh, at a place called Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, 730 delegates from the 44 Allied Nations gathered to decide what this new format would be. And the gathering of the great and the good at Bretton Woods, of probably one of the most famous economic events of the 20th century, proposed a system of fixed exchange rates between the currencies of participants that would be overseen and enforced by the newly created IMF or International Monetary Fund and this is one of a number of bodies that would be created at Bretton Woods that we would still recognise in, in one shape or form today. Uh, they also established the World Bank, at the time it was known as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the IBRD, but now the World Bank as I say, and through that the Marshall Plan which was instrumental really in the rebuilding of Europe and its economies. Uh, the conference also set up the International Trade Organization to ensure and promote free trade across the globe and we would recognize that today as the WTO or World Trade Organization. So the standards that were set up at Bretton Woods would last from just after the, the end of the, uh, of the Second World War until the, uh, until the early 1970s. Uh, but as with the gold standard before it, the limitations of the Bretton Woods system would be exposed by global capital flows, war once again, and the spectre of inflation. And in 1971, in the face of the cost of a, a huge cost for the Vietnam War, and with a growing trade deficit, President Nixon of the US was forced to abandon fixed exchange rates and allow the US dollar to float. Now, that was a momentous decision, and not one I imagine he took very lightly, and it would change the face of, uh, of finance, modern finance forever really. And within one year of the momentous decision to allow uh, the dollar to float, uh, the International Monetary Market or IMM, a Chicago based exchange, will open for business 
and by 1975 it was offering financial futures contracts on both currencies and interest rates. And that was an innovation that many people would see as making as marking rather the birth of modern financial markets. The era of fixed exchange rates was over, though it would not go quietly. Uh, so alongside fixed exchange rates, the governments uh, of the world had sought to control the flow of funds from their shores. Uh, Britain had formally introduced exchange controls at the outset of World War II, not surprising perhaps to protect the currency as, uh, in a time of war, and that legislation would be repealed in 1947, but quite, quite shockingly perhaps to our modern mind, it was simultaneously replaced by similar peacetime rules. And this was quite draconian legislation, and it covered every aspect of overseas trade and commerce, even restricting the amount of spending money you could take with you while traveling abroad. Uh, these I just think about that, somebody telling you how much cash you could actually take out of the country to spend on your holidays. Uh, and these controls would uh, remain in place in the UK until the election of Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government in 1979. So a 32-year period where, where you know, British citizens weren't free to transfer money as they pleased, uh, if they had any, of course, that was. Uh, but uh, thankfully, that nonsense was stopped in 1979. But exchange controls do still exist around the world today and are associated with highly managed economies such as China or India or those with significant economic issues, for instance, in Barbara and Argentina. So it's still with us, but thankfully uh, not on a widespread format. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the ways that people uh, have tried to peg their currency or pin their currency um, to... to strong currencies such as the dollar and, and, and where they're employed around the modern world. So developed modern economies for the most part enjoy floating exchange rates which are set by the market and euros can be sold for dollars, Swedish krona exchanged for Japanese yen quite easily. However some countries still employ a measure of fixing, for instance the Hong Kong dollar, Hong Kong dollar even is pegged at or linked to, the, to its US counterpart and has been for some considerable time. Uh, the Swiss franc, uh, a safe haven currency, has recently been pegged to the euro. A central bank in Switzerland there seeking to shield the Swiss economy from the adver adverse effects of a strong currency. Very difficult for it to do that, but it has tried its best to, uh, to keep the franc at a, what it sees to be a reasonable level. Other methods of trying to fix or peg exchange rates have included currency boards. And these are national bodies set up and charged with maintaining a desired exchange rate. They use reserves or foreign exchange to manage their national currency, often through direct intervention in the marketplace, buying or selling their national currency to affect the rate of exchange. Perhaps the most uh, recent example of that, the best example of that was Argentina's attempts to peg the value of the peso to the US dollar between 1991 and 2002. Ultimately that would fail, but that's probably because of the bigger issues that uh, Argentina had in its economy. Obviously some of those still unresolved to this day. We've also seen in modern times attempts to link groups of currencies together into what were known as currency baskets, and perhaps the most famous of these was the ill-fated ERM, or European Exchange Rate Mechanism, a precursor to the Euro, in which sterling was linked to a basket of other European currencies within a, a range of rates, uh, and each country would try and maintain those exchange rates against the other members of the currency uh, mechanism. Doomed to failure, the market took a tilt at sterling. UK interest rates were forced up to 15% in an attempt to defend the pound, um, and ultimately we had to leave the ERM. Probably worked out for the best for the UK, but at the time it was seen as something of a major setback. So the, the real holy grail, as far as free marketeers are concerned, is to move to the point of full convertibility. And what we mean by that is a currency that can be freely exchanged against its peers without restriction. Um, and to some extent, we have got to that point in the modern, uh, the modern world. Information and communications revolution that we've seen over the last two decades, alongside moves towards global free trade in the last 30 years, has facilitated a move to, to this point in time. So modern currencies, such as the dollar, sterling, the euro, and the, and the Japanese yen could all be thought of as being fully convertible. However, the free movement of money 
and the exchange of currencies around the globe has brought its own set of challenges and we'll come on to discuss more about that I think in, uh, in future webinars both from the point of view of uh, what it means to have free flows of capital uh, at the scale they are today and, uh, and even you know the, uh, the, cha the, the challenges that uh, taking cash from one country to another might present to uh, modern, modern world citizens today. So with that note I'd like to uh, invite Clive to uh, to uh, take over. Thank you very much, Clive. If you're Join ready. Join the party. Ho ho! How are we? Right. Let me. All right. Thank you very much, Darren. That was really, really um, interesting stuff. And um, you know, I think uh, it looks like I'm going to be carrying on the um, the historical context, if you like, because a lot of what I was going to say today. Right, let me see, I want to show a screen, which screen do I want to show? Just bear with me a second please people, because I've, um, I've got a bunch of screens, and I think this is the one I want. Right, let me see, have you got what you want to see? Are we seeing what you want to see? Uh, I wonder if anyone can let me know on that front. Have I got, uh, does it say technical analysis, introduction, history and basics? So that's what I wanted to say. Okay, excellent stuff. Um, yeah, Darren, thank you very much. Really interesting, um, and I, I do think that it's useful. Well, my personal view is, I think it's really useful to have the, some historical context and to um, sort of understand how things came about, what they, um, you know, what why they're here, and why they've become, um, you know, what we what we see, use, and know today. Um, and you know, so. What we're planning to do with these webinars is for Darren to be doing that kind of thing with the um, with the with the fundamental side of the uh, of the coin, if you like. Um, and I will very much stick to talking about the charts and the technical analysis. So hopefully you'll get that nice balance of the two things. And, and hopefully, even though me and Darren have known each other for a very long time, I'd like to think we'll occasionally. Uh, have a little on screen or on air dis, um, disagreement, and you can you know, you look everyone attending will be able to hear it <laughs> hear it unfold in front of them, which could be some fun. Um, right, where am I? Well, yeah. So as I say, Darren's a fundamental analyst, or he's looking more at the, at the reasons why things happen. Um, and I I I. Mm, just to introduce myself, I worked on the futures floor for um, 10 years before I set up my um, technical analysis business and, um, and one of the things that I always struggled with when I was working uh, on the futures floor was this question of why. You know, the market's just said that, or um, well, we've just found out the new, you know, some news and the market appears to be doing almost the opposite to, um, to what, was, what, what it should do under these situations. And so that really got my um, got me thinking. Well, I don't know, you know. It, it, and, and and actually, one of the things I remember, and the nice thing about working in a room with three thousand other people is you could ask somebody else. You know, you go, "Am I going mad, or should it have done that?" And um, sometimes, and the thing I used to hear from people more than anything was people saying, um, "Well, the market doesn't want to go up. That's why it's going down." And that got me thinking. I thought, "Well, hang on a minute." The, you know, the market should re respond to news and things like that um, in an expected manner, but when it doesn't, it can quite often be because this sentiment just isn't that way round. Um, now, you know, so and sentiment. Then I thought, well, sentiment—that's really important. Then sentiment's a big part of, um, of 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 what drives markets, and that is really what started my journey in technical analysis and got me looking at charts. Because for me, the charts tell you everything you need to know, um, and you don't have to work out why. You can just worry about where or how, i.e., where the price is and how it got there. Now there was a bunch of guys a few years back, um, and this is the top right um, part of the slide that I'm talking about. The efficient, um, the efficient market hypothesis. They said, "Well, the market's just random. You can't possibly predict what's going to happen next, and uh, it's ridiculous to try and even do so." Um, and 
that got a lot of traction uh, amongst market participants for a long time and said, yeah, 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 I can see what they're saying, I can see what they're doing. And um, it became known as random walk theory is another name for it. Well, these guys set up a, um, a, a massive fund where they traded this idea basically on a daily, on, you know, on, on, in the markets. And they called it um, they called it long term capital management. Now, if you want to carry on your history lesson, have a look back, Google it, have a look on uh, something like you know, have a, have a look on Google for LTCM or long term capital management. And what you'll find out is it's the, one of the biggest failures in hedge fund history. Because it turns out that their theory, if you like, that the markets are efficient and will always revert back to a normal price, was wrong. Um, flawed. And that's because markets aren't random. Markets do have um, periods where they trend, where they just move in one direction and there's nothing random about that whatsoever, which is very much what um, us technical analysts look at. I am a believer in technical analysis. I'm a believer that the market has um, trends and uh, we're going to look at some of those principles of technical analysis as we go through the slides. There has been a bit of a um, another school of thought coming into things lately which um, you might want to uh, look into a little bit more called behavioral finance. Again, it's very much rooted from academia who is saying that actually, well, the markets are sort of uh, the result of human decision making processes which themselves are flawed because we are I'm afraid we're all flawed <laughs> um, with things like emotion that can have an effect on the market overall. And, and they get, but again, I think that the principles of behavioral finance and technical analysis are pretty similar actually, because what we're talking about is human psychology moving the markets around and putting the market, you know, and, and having a stamp on where prices are and whether things have got, uh, whether things are trending or trend less or whether they are trending too much to one, to, in one direction or the other. So what is a chart? And Darren's history lesson was, um, was a little, it was just a, a tour de force starting um, with, uh, you know, banks on the, um, and actually they're called banks. I didn't interrupt you at the time, Daz, because um, I think uh, they're called banks because they originally set up shop on the bank on the um, river banks in um, Venice, something like that. My history lesson is a little bit shorter term. It's actually the lifespan of my career in the city, and that's the chart we can see above. And it's just to illustrate what is a chart. On the very bottom left-hand corner of that chart, you can see. And this is actually the FTSE index, okay, that I'm, I'm charting here just with a line, basically. Um, and I do, I think that's something like a monthly chart. So each data point on there is one month. So far left, the Black Monday crash of 1987. And there's a few people making similarities, you know, to making um, comparisons with that now. And I think it's only just because it's October and the weather's got a little bit rubbish. But um, <laughs> what we've seen so far, um, in the last week or two in equity markets which are weakening is nothing quite as severe as um, what we saw back then and actually if I was to put this on a different scale you could really see that but anyway that was the start that was my first year in the city um, was a very good uh, baptism of fire as to um, as, uh, as to what the markets were all about and also taught me which I was eternally grateful for really, um, to expect the unexpected and never to be surprised. Um, because if, as you can see from that moment onwards, all the way through really to about 2000, we were in a very strong bull market. There was a blip in 1992 which was called Black Wednesday. We like to have, you know, that seems the very dark days obviously when the markets um, do this kind of thing. Black Wednesday was actually the day I bought my first house and interest rates doubled so I had a bit of a sweat on for a small period of time there. Um, but then the dot com fuel got going and we, uh, rally got going and, um, and, we, and then there was another interruption there, the Russian debt crisis. And then we got to 2000 and the dot-com bubble burst. And that really was a classic bubble type of thing with investor behavior very much um, for dot-com stocks and the internet is going to take over the world, which it has really, but um, you know, uh, not quite in the way we were uh, expecting at that point. 
One amusing footnote to that actually, that was exactly around the time that I set my business up and I called my business futurestext.com limited, which it still is to this day, even though having a dot com on the end of it didn't make me an instant multimillionaire in the year 2000, but there you go. Um, the FTSE since then, the FTSE got up to about 7,000 at that point and it's been there twice since, and most recently in the last few months and it can't get above there. And it's really interesting to sort of think about that from a psycho, you know, the psychology of that barrier to the upside is exactly the sort of thing that chartists like myself are looking for to give us clues as to what the, um, the future direction of the market could be. Um, as I say, we've been up to the high, you know, 6,800 to 7,000 now three times, okay? We've got it here on the dot-com bubble, we've got another spike out here in 2007 which was swiftly followed by the banking crisis and a massive drop and actually interestingly each time the drop the low in 2003 was around three and a half thousand the low in 2009 was around three and a half thousand and that's half that's basically the index halving twice in a decade um, and there's some, some symmetry to those numbers and it's all those kind of things that as a technical analyst I'm looking for um, and you know, those, those recurring patterns of behavior and that kind of thing. So I'm going to do my little history lesson now as far as charts are concerned and um, the very first charts that we can really find um, date back to the 1700s and were, do, were, were used by Japanese rice traders um, that look, good looking chap here on the um, top right of our page is a chap called Muneshi Homa, who was a rice trader uh, in that time. He was such a good trader, he was elevated to samurai status, which I've always thought was a rather marvellous sort of, um, you know, sort of a progression to make, the samurai trader. Uh, hopefully we've got a couple of those listening or in the making, you never know. Um, as far as the Western world was concerned, it was really the late 1800s and early 1900s when people started to chart the market. And, and um, I've got a few names in there. The one you will probably recognize, you know, of early pioneers of technical analysis, the one you'll probably most recognize is Charles Dow, and we'll have a bit more of a look at his work in a second. Um, there was a lot of um, computing power started to have its say in um, chart work in the uh, early 70s really and there was a few guys who came up with momentum indicators and studies that we will look at in later seminars that can help you add some color to uh, what, you're, what you're trying to uh, think about what's going on with the market. And then when um, floor trading, I mean Darren mentioned the IMM, that was actually traded on a futures floor like my picture on the bottom right there. Um, and that's actually a picture of the Chicago futures floor in its heyday. I was privileged enough to work on the London futures floor for 10 years and I can tell you it was an amazing, fantastic place to work. And it also organized the data and the, and the you know, it's, it looked like it was just a big noisy chaos, but it actually organized things quite beautifully and you, you got an understanding of, um, of who was operating in the market and how it was working. And that developed, uh, that, and there was a guy in the States called Peter Steelmeyer who developed something called Market Profile and he was a trader in the pits um, um, and wanted to try and organize the data in a different way that sort of suited his needs and that, um, we'll get onto that again as I say. Today really just want to introduce a few things to you, later seminars we want to really get inside the nuts and bolts and start to um, show you some methodologies that you can use in your trading. One simple takeaway that I'd like to give you today is comes from our friend Charles Dow. Now Charles Dow never wrote a book but there's been plenty written about his work and he actually has become known as Dow Theory. Charles Dow didn't write a book but he did write something every day. He did write what was known, what he called the Wall Street Letter. That later morphed into something that you may recognize, the Wall Street Journal. And let's just keep it at real basics for now. Charles Dow came up with something that's still really relevant to yourselves. Whatever you're trading, whatever time frame you're trading, whatever instrument you are trading, uh, and if you're going to look at charts, this is the first thing you should read. You see, this is, you know, lesson number one and something I think is very, very useful 
very very simple which is this it's been up on the screen for a while so you probably have the chance to read it an uptrend is a series of higher highs and higher lows okay so if you look on your chart and the highs are getting higher and the lows are getting higher because markets don't generally go up or up up in a straight line or down in a straight line uh, it's uh, you know the, the path to higher prices is usually a sort of zigzag type affair if those zigzags are higher highs and higher lows that's an uptrend the market's rising and the best way to trade an uptrend is to to buy the dips and to be long and to try and stay trade with the trend a downtrend is when the market conditions change to a series of lower highs and lower lows and that's pretty simple stuff and I think it's extremely effective and very useful starting you know, starting blocks for any um, trading strategy try and trade in the direction of the trend um, and, I, and I think and a useful analogy I used to do this with um, guys I was training in prop traders in London I'd say to them what's the best way to walk across London Bridge in the morning is it uh, from south to north which actually means you're you're going with everybody else who's going into work or would it be north to south which means you are go you're walking against the flow of human traffic and most people gave me the answer I was looking for which was go with the flow if you like and I do believe you know, that would make it easier for you to cross the bridge and I believe that that's a useful analogy to make with respect to trading and trading trends uh, and we're at a time and I think we want to I'd like to look at a couple of, um, of rec recent charts to to give you something of a, uh, a little bit of color on what we're thinking at this very moment in time um, but let's just go through a few of the chart types this is called a line chart and is just basically joining up data points with a line and this is the euro US dollar over the last six months actually quite relevant that I've used that chart because Darren was talking earlier about how we've seen a significant uh, weakness in the euro and strength in the dollar in recent times um, you can see that quite clearly from our chart the euro US dollar FX rate has gone from 138 something to 126 something um, and has been making a steady series of higher of, of lower highs and lower lows during that period we are now we've just made um, a, we're, we're trying to change that trend now but we haven't quite done it from a Dow theory point of view as yet so that's a line chart, very basic. Next chart is the same amount, same piece, same data. Actually, it's not the same data because what we're doing here is we've we've given each day. Well, we've got a bar for each day, which shows the open, the high, the low, and the close. And the um, the high and the low are represented by the long line. Um, okay, so so let me say, if I can, yeah, well, by the by each of these lines, each of these uh, vertical lines is a day. That's the range. The little line off to the left is where we opened, the little line off to the right is where we closed. In Forex, uh, yesterday's close is generally today's open because the market's for 24 hours. And they're bar charts. Now have a look at this. That's a candle chart. And actually, what we do with candle charts is put some color onto the uh, thing. When it's squeezed up this tight and on a screen this small, you can, that color doesn't really help you. So what I wanted to do is show you actually the same period of data which is this year so far in the US the euro against the US dollar and this is a candlestick chart where every single candlestick on there is one week's worth of price action so the open is where it trades actually on Sunday night in Tokyo and the closing price for, to, to construct each candle is where we finish on a Friday night in the States and if it's red, that means we opened high and closed low, i.e. the sellers dominated that session. And you can see that from August, well actually, you know, from, the, from July all the way through to almost the end of September, um, we were getting um, a series of red candles a week, week, a week, week. <laughs> yeah, weeks where the sellers were dominating and weakness was, uh, was in charge. Uh, last week and so far this week are green candles so we are seeing some buying returning at these low levels this is actually something called no I, I, look, I've got this wrong this is today's typo that says candlestick it should say point and figure uh, so apologies for that um, how, 
how silly of me. I wonder if I can... Um, no, I'm not going to bother trying to change it now. I told you this wrong. Um, that is a point and figure chart, and it's actually uh, noughts and crosses representing uh, down and up periods. And again, something we'll look at later, how it's constructed. But they were the charts that Westerners used in those early days, those early days of Charles Dow and, um, and, and, and the traders in the, in, in the US in the um, early 20th century. Um, and one thing that I look at, uh, which is uh, part of my daily analysis and um, an overlay that I like to use, is um, is the market profile charts. And again, that was, came from, as I said, that trader, um, the, you know, a trader on the uh, in the futures market in Chicago in the 80s. He formulated this, and it, as you can see, they're all very different sort of ways of looking at the chart. They're all using the same data. I'm just scrolling through them now: line chart, bar chart candlestick chart, the different time frame candlestick chart, the point and figure chart, the market profile chart, all of those charts use the same data. Okay? But they all organize it rather differently and maybe give us different um, sorts of interpretations and things that we might be able to uh, glean from them. Um, again you can put you can see now this last chart that I've put on has got a few lines on there. We're putting the lines on there to say these are the old highs and lows, this is what we're looking for. Got a couple of boxes that I've opened up under here and these are momentum studies. And again, something we can look at um, as we um, advance our sort of um, you know, what we're going to talk about um, on these particular um, webinars. So I'm going to finish off by just looking through the three core principles of technical analysis. And they are this, markets move in trends and trends persist. I think I've talked about this already. But the interesting part about this is that um, is, is this second bullet point here, psychological and otherwise. Um, the sentiment of the market is included in a chart, whereas it maybe isn't so much in fundamentals, fundamental analysis doesn't really like to do or doesn't deal with the reality of sentiment of the crowd. Price action is repetitive, patterns emerge and repeat. So as a technical analyst, I'm looking for things to that that, um, that, that work over and over again that seem to uh, reoccur with respect to price action and price movement. And this creates certain patterns that we can quantify, that we can say, right, there it is. It's, this one likes to do X, Y, Z, and we're seeing X, Y, Z happen. So we've got a chance of thinking this is, you know, that the, the market, what the probabilities are of the market moving in a certain direction in the future. Um, probably the most, you know, one of the most important things about technical analysis is everything, everything is in the price, okay? It's a supply and demand thing. It's a, your first lesson, you know, at, in an economics um, at, at, at school, uh, supply and demand, buyers and sellers set the price. Okay, and again, it comes back to that thing where buyers and sellers are not necessarily rational, and so um, that irrationality can reflect sometimes in wild movements on the price chart. And I believe personally, and so do many of my colleagues in my industry, that technical analysis, the charts, are the best way to try and. Um, and pick the bones out of that. Um, so what we're looking at, we don't. I don't need to know why something is going up or down, but I'd like. To, but I'm. But I do. You know, well, I'm. I'm. I'm concerning myself with where something is and how it got there. Because to me, the why can be somewhat mysterious. I don't. I'm, I, I don't think I, I often say I'm not clever enough to understand the fundamentals. I'll leave that to people like Darren. <laughs> um, and and so I think technical analysis can actually level the playing field a little bit there as well because we've all we've all got uh, access to similar data. Um, so I think we'll give that one a miss for now. Oh, oh no, I won't actually because it's a nice little story to finish up. Three books I'd recommend you read: Reminiscences of a Stock Operator by Edwin Lefebvre, Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets by John J. Murphy. And of course, I'd be amiss to myself if I didn't try and plug my book on candlesticks. <laughs> and so they're the three books that I'm sure if you went away and read, then you'd have either, you'd already have a pretty good skill on what's going on. Now, technical, the middle one is the most important one, Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets by John J. Murphy. This is what's really uh, widely acknowledged as the Bible for technical analysis. And John J. Murphy is the guru. That's where my last slide comes in. I was at a conference at the weekend, and look, it's a, as is the way in the modern world, I got myself a selfie 
with John J. Murphy, the man himself, the man who wrote the book. So that was a big privilege for me to meet Mr. Murphy and to um, have a chat with him and um, I even persuaded him that he should be supporting South and United in the, um, which is my soccer team. I think once he realises how South, how good or bad, how bad South end are, he might change his mind. Anyway, I think now I should be on the same slide and I'm going to leave you with one or with a couple of charts, up to date um, charts that are going on right now and does if you want to say anything about these then please do. First chart is the S&P 500 and I think I'll try and go to a, um, a weekly time frame. You know, the S&P 500 has been travelling higher since 2009 down here okay? and steady, not nice and steady. Look at these higher highs and higher lows, nothing to worry about there. And if we get, but if we get right down to where we are now, it was travelling in this channel here. It broke that channel last week, and we have actually now we've made a lower low than the August low at 1890. That was why equities sold off yesterday. That's why we had a nasty reaction low in equities yesterday, and I think that that's something significant. And yesterday, actually. I was looking at a level around 1906 um, and again as we go through the webinars and I show you more and more of the methodologies I employ, hopefully you'll be able to get these levels yourself. This is something called a Fibonacci retracement. And that made me think yesterday that 1906 and a half in the S&P 500 futures, the biggest and most important futures equity index in the world arguably, was going to be an important resistance level. Now, if we take this down to a 30-minute time frame, and excuse some of the mess on my charts. Now I've got a candlestick chart where every candlestick is 30 minutes, and that was the open yesterday in the States, and we got up to 1906, and then sold off to 1884, and then we rallied as the day session went on, and by half past five UK time, so about three hours into US trade, we failed at 1906 again. These these are a couple of what I call candlestick reversal patterns and we'll show you, you know, they're in my book and something we can show you later on. But they are what started that failure to get through 1906 triggered a big sell-off that we saw into the close in the US. Um, and that for me is quite a compelling chart. The most the other really compelling chart, and again we will get to grips with some of the terminology and some of the methodology in later seminars. But one of the really big compelling charts at the moment is this is this this is the German index. This is what we call the DAX. The DAX got up to 9,800 in January and then came down to 8,900. It made a new high in June above 10,000 and then came back to 8,900. And it went up again and in mid-September failed at 90 at 9,900. So I think it's fair to say that 89 here, this low and this low here was reasonably important and sure enough it proved to be because when we broke below there, you know, since we've broken below there we have in very swift time dropped two or three hundred points and the suggestion from that chart is we can keep going and we can go down to uh, levels like 8450, 8100 and, um, and, and below. So that's, and that's called a head and shoulders pattern. Again, we'll do that in a later seminar. Um, Darren, I know, is bit, keeps an eye on his charts as well and would have, would have been very aware of this. I think Darren's one of those people who can mix them both up and I think it's a nice way well, of doing it. Actually, actually, Clive, I, I would just say something here. I, I, I'm in complete agreement with you about where the risk lies. It's very much to the downside. Um, my, you know, the chart that struck a chord with me it was the, uh, the Dow uh, yesterday, which broke strongly below the key 200 day exponential moving average. I think the other thing I draw people's attention to uh, is the signs of life in the VIX index, the index that measures volatility. Uh, fear, if you like, is often referred to as the fear index and that yeah. moved sharply up I think by 16% uh, back up and up to a level 24.6 I think it, it closed. Which is, which is generally an indication of weakness to come because as you say it's, it is sort of known as the fear index. Okay. It's called, it's, it's actually just a volatility index but markets, equity markets tend to go up slowly and down quickly 
which is why the VIX index spikes when the market starts to really sell off, which is you know, I think, why we're seeing that happening now. I think if I were just to say something in summary, because I think we're, I'm right in saying we're, we're probably running out of time for today's session, are, yes. uh, is that it's not going to be, it's going to be a very interesting week. We've got uh, 50 S&P companies uh, reporting Q3 earnings in the States. We've got a lot more inflation data to come out of uh, Europe tomorrow. Uh, we've got uh, Janet Yellen speaking on Friday afternoon, uh, and uh, we've had the International Energy Agency today trimming its forecast for global oil demand uh, to its lowest level, I believe, I'm saying in five years. So there's plenty going on, but of course all of these news news points, data points create opportunity, and that's you know the, the idea of these webinars is to hopefully coach you through what what all these facts and figures and data points mean, and how that uh, you know you guys can come to take advantage of them because obviously markets thrive on data, uh, on on news. Uh, uh, news flow and you know these these key points and whether you look at them from a technical point of view whether you follow them from a fundamental point of view those those key data points are, uh, and, and changes that we took, touched on today are the things that are going to inform your trading so um, I hope you'll be able to join us on Thursday uh, for the next session in which we'll, we'll take a closer look at uh, what, what some of the, the factors are that drive FX markets what some of these data points actually are um, I've certainly enjoyed today's session. I hope you have too. I'm sure you'd say the same, Clive. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, yes. So, always uh, a pleasure to see, it's, well, not I haven't seen you, Darren, but it's always a pleasure to have a natter with you, my friend. Absolutely. I feel the same <laughs> here. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it, found it instructive. Do, do contact us if you have any questions uh, about what we've discussed today, and we will endeavour to uh, get back to you as soon as we can. So thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Okay, guys, Goodbye. it was a pleasure to have you all in the audience today. The next webinar will take place on Thursday, the same time, the same place, 11 o'clock London time. I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. It's the end of our first webinar. Thank you very much for joining.